Hello everybody, welcome back to Vlogmas and we've got another Narnia book today. So today's book is The Silver Chair from my big book of the Chronicles of Narnia. That is the front section of this bit. There's that cover of The Silver Chair. As I was reading the book, because The Silver Chair itself doesn't come in until more than halfway through the book, I was wondering what the title was referencing throughout the majority of it. So in this book, you follow the action with Eustace and a friend of his from school called Jill Pole. I say friend. <laughs> They're more acquaintances at that point. And to be fair, Jill doesn't really like Eustace. Eustace doesn't really like Jill. But uh, together they find themselves in Narnia. So they're at school to begin with and they uh, start to run away from some kids that are kind of bullies and Eustace tells Jill about his previous adventures in Narnia and Jill kind of just believes him and then uh, Eustace says I'm going to take you to Narnia you know chart with me Aslan 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 and then suddenly as they're running away the door to a garden at the bottom of their school transforms into a portal to Narnia and they find themselves in Narnia where they are given a mission to find a lost prince who is Caspian's son. Caspian is now an elderly king and they are on the search for Caspian's son. I have to show you pictures again. You've got Pole and Scrub as they refer to throughout the book. Scrub is Eustace, Pole is Jill. Um, you've got them arriving in Narnia not really knowing where they are. At that point, they're technically not in Narnia. They're, I think they're at the end of the world at that point. And then Aslan sends them to Narnia. Basically, there is a bit of an accident where both Jill and Eustace are on the edge of a cliff. And Jill, on purpose, accidentally, pushes Eustace off the cliff, where he then is blown by Aslan to Narnia, which uh, Jill is then blown on the breath of Aslan to Narnia when she is given the task to search for the lost prince. So she is given four things to remember and to follow and she's forced to repeat these with Aslan until it's ingrained into her head. Throughout the book she kind of forgets about them and re-remembers them but there is a certain order to it. Yeah so um, here is the task as quoted by Aslan. <laughs> Far from here in the land of Narnia there lives an aged king who is sad because he has no prince of his blood to be king after him. He has no heir because his only son was stolen from him many years ago and no one in Narnia knows where that prince went or whether he is still alive but he is. I lay on you this command that you seek this lost prince until either you have found him and brought him to his father's house or else died in the attempt or else gone back into your own world so that is the first bit and then the lion gives her the explicit things that she needs to remember and recite first as soon as Eustace sets foot in Narnia he will meet an old and dear friend he must greet that friend at once if he does you will both have good help second you must journey out of Narnia to the north till you come to the ruined city of the ancient giants third you shall find a writing on a stone in that ruined city and you must do what the writing tells you. Fourth, you will know the lost prince if you find him by this, that he will be the first person you have met in your travels who will ask you to do something in my name, in the name of Aslan. Unfortunately for Jill and for Eustace, they miss the first moment. The old friend is Caspian and Eustace does not get a chance to talk to him mainly because they are distracted by the troll. <laughs> Everything else that ha that happens seems to happen by accident. I almost said on accident there and I would have hated myself for that because it's not on accident it's by accident. It's by accident and on purpose. <laughs> Remember that. I constantly see people saying it wrong and it annoys me. Uh, as I said, you know, it says the first step is to remember, repeat me in order the four signs is what Aslan says. And so when she doesn't get it right, when she recites it back, Aslan gets her to repeat it back like a monologue and says, you'll remember this, you'll repeat this, and you need to remember this because 
these are the things that need to happen in order for you to find the prints. Did I read the blurb to you? I give you all of that. I've essentially read you the blurb there, but anyway, I'll read the blurb to you now. Narnia, where giants wreak havoc, where evil weaves a spell, where enchantment rules. Through dangers untold, at caverns deep and dark, a noble band of friends is sent to rescue a prince held captive. But their mission to Underland brings them face to face with an evil more beautiful and more deadly than they ever expected. It's interesting to say that it's a complete standalone read, but I feel like it does help in these bits to know what happened before because there are so many references to the previous books, mainly the adventures of the Pevensey kids, especially as in this book the Pevenseys aren't included as characters, but there are references to them as previous kings and queens of Narnia. Even though they aren't in the book, they are still important to the plot to know what has happened previously. But yeah, so as you go through, you realise they've completely messed up the first one. Jill tells Eustace, you know, how long have you been here? You must have been here for an hour because it felt like that was how long it was. Turns out they arrive within minutes of each other. Eustace does not get a chance to see and meet and talk to Caspian. So the first one is kind of written off. They don't have the help from Caspian. They do, however, make a friend who then escorts them on their journey. But yeah, so they get help from owls, as you do. But yeah, their main help comes from what is called a marsh wiggle. He's described as like a dwarf, but taller. <laughs> That makes sense. Basically, he has very, very long legs and arms, but his body is the shape of a dwarf's. I know, that sounds really bizarre. That's the, literally the description of it in the book. They saw that he had very long legs and arms, and that although his body was not much bigger than a dwarf's, he could be taller than most men when stood up. The fingers of his hands were webbed like a frog's, and so were his bare feet, which dangled in the muddy water, dressed in earth, the coloured clothes that hung loose about him. The marsh wiggle is called Puddle Glum. And he is very pessimistic and <laughs> is constantly reminding the kids of how things can go wrong to the point where Jill uses her positivity on him and says, as I would not have sent us on this mission if we thought we were in danger. So as long as we stick by Aslan's rules, we should be fine. <laughs> Which ultimately, in a Narnia book, they will be. But there's a bit of adventure along the way. Here's the um, image of the kids with Puddle Glum, the Marsh Wiggle. But yeah, it's basically their mission to get across Narnia and find the missing prints, um, which ultimately ended up taking them underground. Though there are a couple of missteps across the way, especially when they meet a woman who points them in the direction of giants. Uh, but yeah, they come across a woman and what he described as a knight on horseback. She is uh, riding a side saddle, as you do. And uh, when they say they are looking for the giant's ruined city, she sends them in the direction of the giants and says, well, there's giants that way. They're having a festival soon so that you should knock on the door before noon because that's when they lock the gates. But if you knock on there before noon, they should welcome you in and uh, look after you and uh, keep you well fed and then if you're good they'll invite you to the festival which as soon as they entered I went into the giants are going to eat them aren't they the giants are going to eat them so when it came out that the giants were getting ready to eat them it was just like yeah <laughs> this is what life has taught me <laughs> don't go towards the giants because they're going to try and eat you as part of their festival. But when the kids finally figure it out, when they come across a massive cookbook that says how to cook man, that is when they hightail it out of there and try to avoid being hunted. But that takes them to um, an area underground. It's actually on the way to, because it's snowing when they're on their way to the giant city. And they don't realize that in their climb over to the giants, that they actually climb over the ruined city which is covered in snow so when they are inside the giant's castle and they look out and they realize that they walked through it all they're just like damn it we need to go back and we need to look for the signs because ultimately they get distracted by the idea of food and heat inside the giant's castle that they completely forget about uh 
Aslan's messages and saying what they need to look for. So when they do finally look back at just like, that is the city we've been looking for. And there's a message telling us to essentially go underground. A lot of the story after that is spent underground as they go through and meet new characters and are trying to find their way down and down and down to the point where they forget what daylight looks like. It's never explicitly stated how long they're under there for but it seems like it's a very very long time but it comes to a point where they come across a group of people and a man underneath who it turns out was the guy on the horse that was accompanying the woman who sent them to the giant's castle to essentially be eaten and at first the guy is there going well i don't think she did it on purpose i think she was just trying to find you warmth and heat and then you find out that there's some kind of curse on him and that there's a point when in the evening when this curse makes him go crazy and he is strapped to a silver chair this story is so ridiculous, but stay with me. <laughs> so he is strapped to a silver chair to a point when he goes completely crazy. And it is while he is strapped, just before he is strapped to the chair, he says, you know, I go absolutely crazy. Under no circumstances are you to untie me from this chair, no matter how much I plead. So they're just like, right, we know not to do that. So um, ultimately when he do it hits the time and he starts going crazy and he starts having this fit, and he's there going, in the name of Aslan, untie me now. And they go, wait, he's mentioned Narnia now, and now he's said in the name of Aslan. And we have been told we must do what we have been told in the name of Aslan, by Aslan himself. And they're going, if it's a coincidence, do we actually have to untie him? What is going on? So ultimately, they just go, no, Aslan told us to obey anything that is done in the name of him, in the name of Aslan. So they untie him, where he reveals he's the lost prince. They found him. Now they need to get him out. <laughs> and they have a battle with the witch. <laughs> and there's lots of things about comparing witches and saying ultimately they all have the same goal, they just have different ways to go about it. Um, and you find out that the witch was trying to get the prince to become king of the overworld as they call it and when they do finally make it to the surface the prince realizes that the land that he was supposed to overtake and become king of is his own land it's narnia and when they make it to the surface at first they don't realize they've made it to the surface because it's so dark but then it's pole that first pops her head up and she's like, oh wait, no, this isn't just a dark light. That's the moon. <laughs> and it's snowing. <laughs> so seeing the friendship between Eustace and Jill and how that develops, you also realise that not being in Narnia has made it so that Eustace has gone back to some of his old ways. Basically, Narnia gives him the strength to become a confident, unbratty child. Um, but without Narnia, um, he kind of goes back into his old ways again. They say at the beginning of the book that there was a brief moment when he seemed like a changed child when he came back from Narnia, but then he started to settle back into kind of his old ways again. He wasn't as bad as he was originally, but it does sound like he reverted into some old habits. But you like to think that after this, Eustace is going to hold on to that Narnia strength a little bit more. Can you tell I enjoyed this one? Oh, I must admit, it felt longer. It should tell me in here how many pages it is, roughly. 272. So I think other ones have been close to like the, between 100 and 200 pages. So this one is a longer one. So, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe if you're not already. And I will see you tomorrow with another book review. With the way these are going, it probably seems like I read at an incredible speed. But I am filming this at the end of August. So, it's quick, but it's not that quick. <laughs> so yeah, Chronicles of Narnia. Oh, I just lost the page. <laughs> I need to go back. <laughs>